Uh, welcome to um, the commencement uh, program of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. Uh, commencement uh, lectures are uh, an important part of JGU's calendar. Uh, this year, of course, uh, the new batch joins in on the 1st of September uh, instead of the 1st of August. Um, but somehow, it, you know, the semester never feels it started till we have the commencement lecture. So uh, a very warm welcome uh, to everyone. Uh, we'll begin with uh, a, a welcome speech by uh, the Dean of the School of uh, Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, Professor Kathy <coughs> Madrowski. Um, Professor Madrowski, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Gianni. And uh, welcome everyone to the start of the 2020-21 academic year. It is my honor to welcome our guest lecturer, Gita Hariharan, a noted writer, social activist, and a cultural critic. She's going to give the lecture, the commencement lecture, and I know we're all going to be interested having seen the topic. We are also honored to have our remarkable Vice Chancellor C. Raj Kumar with us, and he's going to deliver the keynote address. Uh, and it is also our pleasure to have Dr. Sridhar Parknayak with us today. Uh, many of you may know him as the head of the disciplinary committee and also as the registrar, he is now the registrar of the uh, of JGU. So, you know, welcome. And again, we're really honored to have you here in your new position. We have some new faculty who have never attended this event, and I'd like to say hello to them and welcome them. It's Shriti Ganguly, Satyaki, Kan um, Kanjilal, and Matthew Crippen. Uh, they will be joining us on campus as soon as everyone's able to join campus. And finally, I'd like to welcome with a really hearty uh, sense of warmth to the students of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities and the Jindal Fellowship Program. So welcome and soon I hope we'll be able to see you. I'll just say a few words before we begin with the important part of the program. Uh, all around the world, I think all of you are used to hearing it now, people are saying this year is unlike any other return to class. The pandemic has put our lives on remote. We live, communicate, and learn through the internet. Now, three questions have emerged that form a sort of light motif anytime we start a conversation. The first one is, how are you doing? Next, and often at the same time, people ask, can you hear me? And finally, how are we doing? I'd like to go through these and examine them very briefly to give you an idea of how I see our world coming together. The first question, which is, how are you doing, is really one that is a question of concern. It marks the concern that we have for each other, the concern that we feel for our faculty, our parents, fellow students, mentors, everyone in our world. And this is a question now that has new meaning. How are you doing? We're in an unfamiliar space, an unfamiliar place, and we're trying to construct a new way of living together. It's also a way to encourage us, the how are you doing, to live fully in the present. Something that we've been able to put off for a while, but now I don't think we can. It's a time where we build uh, resilience and a sense of hope. It's also a time where we look closely at our future goals and we recognize and acknowledge our loss. That's another important part of taking a look at this, expressing how we're doing to ourselves and to others. 
The second question, can you hear me, is a very loaded question. Because you may be saying that to your teacher to say, am I giving you the right answer? Am I giving you what you really want to hear? Or to your family and your friends, you might be saying, can you hear me? Meaning, do you really know what I'm saying? Do you know what this time means to me? Because we only have a verbal way of acknowledging who we are and where we are in time and space. And then it may be the very banal issue that's very important and crucial though in the learning set um, session and it is, is my mic working? Everyone seems to be preoccupied with, can you be heard correctly? Is technology working for you? So all of these really are questions of perception. And I think that going into the remote world will give us a chance to look at perception. What are those elements? What's the physicality? What's the psychological uh, aspect of it? And I'm sure you will be having these conversations with your faculty, with your mentors, with family and friends. The third question, how are we doing? This how are we doing really is an emphasis, I will place the emphasis on the university and on our university community. Letting you say to us, how are we doing? We want to know as part of the university community and you're part of it, how we're doing, how are we fulfilling your needs to educate, to support you, to make you feel safe where you are. I don't know if you realize how much effort has gone into trying to provide a very strong learning program. The intimacy of the small classroom is not with us anymore. We have to replicate some of those things that we've lost. We have to train teachers. We have to train students. We have to look at what we teach, how we teach, and what you're getting out of it. And remote learning also is sparking a new form of creativity. I've found that over the last semester and through the prestige programs, what faculty and students are doing is really remarkable. So I think that that's something that we will all really go into more and more as really the world, not just our university, but the world will be turning on uh, using technology more and more. In addition to these questions related to our education is uh, going to the counseling and health services. A lot has been done on campus to really Im not improve, but to adapt to counseling and health services. Your mentors, uh, people in your program, and I'm sure the vice chancellor can fill you in if you ever want to know the huge efforts that are being done in that area. But also something else that really impresses me is the fact that no one who is part of our campus community is being left behind. And I mean the people who work in the services, the people who work on the grounds, the gardeners, everyone else is, everyone is being taken into consideration and part of this Jindal family, our community, our whole family and they are part of the concerns that we share. But you know, uh, in a way we can ignore some very hard facts as well. And there are some that we could probably wish we didn't have to look at, but this is the one of disparity. I think everyone has to really take into account and realize that only 24% of Indians own a smartphone. 11% of households only possess any type of computer, which could be anything from a laptop to a smartphone to a notebook, et cetera. While 66% of Indian population lives in villages, little over 15% of this rural population have access to internet services. For urban households and rural households, the proportions are quite different. It's 42% 
of urban households do have this access. Rural households have much less. So see, these are some of the questions that we're going to be exploring this year. Questions that talk about what is this divide that we're encountering. Let's keep it, well, let's be aware of it as we go forward in our classes because we're going to have a wonderful year. We're also going to be exploring very seriously the critical issues that face us. And we will continue to live, to learn, and to act. So thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Kathleen, uh, for that encouraging uh, welcome address. Uh, I would now like to uh, welcome uh, Professor Yugam Goel, who is the director of our uh, Jindal Fellowship Program that we are starting this year, to uh, say a few words about this program. Uh, Professor Goel, are you there? Yes, indeed. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Thank you so much, uh, all the students, uh, Geeta, the Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, everyone to join us. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a particularly momentous occasion for us in uh, the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities uh, because we're also launching a new program this year, uh, the Jindal Fellowship Program. Um, and I am aware that uh, many of the students here are indeed from that program. Um, and I think uh, at some level, even though we had planned uh, the program before the pandemic had arrived, but I think the, the, the pandemic's presence only made our resolve stronger, so to speak. Um, the problems of tomorrow are going to be problems that cannot be solved without, um, without an in-depth research. So if you look at a T, uh, the English alphabet T, uh, while a range of your scholarly practices are about the breadth, which is the horizontal bar of the T, uh, in this program, what we are looking at is the vertical bar. So, uh, and in fact, the program really emerged as a response to students' own interest, uh, uh, our own students who, after doing their undergraduate studies, uh, wanted to go deeper into a particular discipline that they really enjoyed. Um, and that is how uh, we conceptualize the program. The program has um, courses which are highly interdisciplinary. Uh, so we, uh, students study research methods, advanced writing. Um, they also study foreign languages. They have an option to do that. There, is, there are two one or two courses on advanced study. These are the courses they take in their own discipline from across Jindal University uh, and not just JSLH, uh, opens up a number of uh, possibilities um, and opening up ways in which people can think in those subjects. They have a four month long research intensive internship, but the most important, oh, and of course they have a course uh, called the Introduction to Future Studies. This is a course that we have designed through amalgamating a range of uh, both theoretical and applied ideas uh, that are around in the world. In fact, uh, you know, uh, any today's newspaper tells us um, that Indian economy has shrunk by 24%. Um, this is a massive shrink. But if you go deeper, you realize that much of it is taken, much of this load of loss is taken by construction, hotel and travel industry, which was expected. The silver lining, however, is that agriculture has grown by almost three and a half percent. Um, which is which is interesting, um, and the, the and these are the things that can only surface if students, researchers, scholars go deeper into the issues of their interest. Um, the world is on a very very um, uncertain path, so to speak, and no better, better time to emphasize the importance of research than this. Um, we have a batch of uh, twenty one students. Uh, I'm happy to say, um, almost. Uh, Two third of which uh, are women. Um, almost two third also are uh, students from our own university who have uh, continue, who have decided to go deeper into this uh, into this postgraduate uh, one year program. Um, and if I have to quickly look at the type of research areas they're interested in, um, so they relate to business and finance, including business of art, business of sports, uh, consumer behavior and behavioral economics. Um, there's a range of students who are interested in psychology workplace psychology, adolescent psychology, counseling, environmental psychology, and of course, social psychology. Students have, ex have also expressed interest to do research in understanding culture and society in the literary texts, um, which, is, which is particularly, uh, particularly interesting. Um, negotiation in crisis, moments that we're going, going through, um, economics of urbanization, um, defense, and, uh, defense strategy and international affairs, we have a student on it, um, applied economics, and of course, journalism. 
perhaps I should uh, um, end here with an important note about the program, which I think is, uh, in our view, one of the most important aspects, uh, which is the, the idea of mentorship. You see, I mean, the more, uh, at some point we thought more information in the world through in information technology is going to be uh, a lot more useful than less information. Uh, but this inundation of, uh, uh, you know, uh, content, so to speak, in the Facebook generation that we have, I think it becomes even more important uh, for young students to have a professional mentor of their own who could guide them or wade them through the waters of unimaginably tempting amount of information out there everywhere. And while at some level we will appreciate, I mean, I'm myself an engineer, then I did law and I'm a doctorate in economics. And in that sense, cross navigating across disciplinary boundaries uh, is of course, uh, you know, an idea we celebrate. Uh, but in that process, the importance of mentors can't be overstated. And so every student in the fellowship program is assigned with a mentor in form of a faculty member from our school uh, who will guide the student throughout the year, not in terms of just what kind of professional career the student should have, but also in writing a research report at the end. And I think that, uh, to my, not, uh, to my, in my, in my view, is going to be one of the most memorable, most uh, uh, unforgettable, uh, and most impactful takeaway from a program of this type. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I would, uh, um, I would like to take up some questions if there are any. And many of the students here who are joining the BLS program, um, I love, I love for you to have an interaction with our fellowship programs, and this engagement will also inspire you to do things uh, and go deeper. In, in research. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Yugang. Uh, I would now like to welcome our founding vice chancellor, uh, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, Professor. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. And uh, thank you, Kathleen and Yugank. And of course, uh, warm welcome to our uh, commencement speaker, uh, Ms. Geeta Hariharan. Um, congratulations uh, to the students of Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities who are joining the BA Honours in Liberal Arts and Humanities. And of course, congratulations to many of our own students, our own alumni, but also others who have joined the Jindal Fellowship Programme. What an extraordinary year and what an extraordinary time for high school students in particular to move into a college or a university and starting their academic journey in a university when you haven't even uh, begun that in a physical sense. So before I say anything, let me just do the second best thing. I'm going to show you the campus, how it looks like as of today. So I'm here in Sonipat. This is the campus view from my office. Uh, the beautiful lawns and grounds which are waiting there. The site of the tennis courts and the cricket ground. And all the way, the hostels out there, uh, all of them are waiting for you anxiously. So that's the second best thing I could do. But uh, we can't uh, you know, wait uh, to see you all on campus. Uh, the whole... Uh, raison d'etre of universities uh, is actually the students and uh, you give us purpose and meaning to our lives and the fact that you are not here uh, the soul of the campus is obviously missing but i i do believe that uh, you each one each one of you have uh, worked very hard to get where you are you have not even taken a break for all those who have completed your 12th standard examinations and have uh, pretty much continued studying and uh, ended up now joining the university. So uh, hats off to you. Uh, you have already exemplified uh, a deep sense of resilience. Uh, and I can only say that with your resilience and with all of us doing what we are supposed to be doing, uh, we do believe that we will be able to overcome this crisis. Um, I do believe that uh, there are lots of people working around the world to find a vaccine, to find a cure, and hopefully we will get there sooner than later. Uh, I'm very delighted today because it's a very special day when we welcome our new students. And I was telling the, uh, uh, your dean that as vice chancellor, uh, this year I am uh, attending and speaking very briefly for in 14 commencement lectures. We have uh, uh, nine schools in the university and each school offers its own commencement lectures. And our law school, uh, you know, because it's also a larger school, it alone is offering six commencement lectures. So 
Uh, I am on a commencement lecture spree. We already had one on Saturday, and now I'm attending my second commencement lecture. But among all the commencement lectures, let me tell you, this is the most special. And I'm not saying this uh, in each lecture. And I'll tell you why it is special. The Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities exemplifies the vision of this university. OP Jindal Global University was created with a view to advance the cause of liberal arts, humanities, social sciences, and professional schools. Very consciously, from the very beginning, we have we decided not to offer STEM-related courses and let alone work towards building a medical school. At a time when Indian universities were constantly building engineering colleges and many engineering colleges were created across the country, we decided not only to move away from that imagination, but in due course ended up creating the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. This school and indeed the university exemplifies the idea of pluralism in all its forms and manifestations. At a time when some of the most fundamental human values are threatened both in India but also around the world for a number of reasons, the School of Liberal Arts and Humanities is consciously working towards protecting some of those values. The students, the faculty, and indeed the intellectual imagination that is advanced by the Jindal School of Human Liberal Arts and Humanities in many ways is part of the philosophy and ideals of a good university. Let me go further. At a time when Indian higher education system is going through an important transition, there are huge challenges relating to the university system, which is unfortunately not being able to promote excellence in all its forms and manifestations. While much of that problem is largely related to lack of vision and imagination, of course, poor governance models and archaic regulatory structures, there are also substantive issues related to the institutional imagination of universities. In recent times, I must say that there has been a systematic attack on the study of liberal arts and humanities, not only in India, but also in other countries where there has been an established tradition that has promoted liberal arts education, including the United States. So let me begin by saying that the first and critical aspect of what I would like to say is we need to promote liberal arts education and together we will do so. Given the lack of quality liberal arts and humanities colleges in India, there is a need to have many such schools to deepen democracy and produce an enlightened citizenry that is able to adapt itself to the changing demands and circumstances of the contemporary world. Now, of course, we know that in India, we are a young country. Over 850 million people in India are less than 35 years of age. None of us who are speaking are less than 35. All of you who are listening are less than 35. These young people, each one of you, are not only going to shape the future of India, but will shape the future of the world. And hence, we need to promote liberal education. Second, acquiring knowledge. Liberal education promotes intellectual curiosity, which is critical for the growth and development of any individual in a society. It helps in the process of creating knowledge and sharing perspectives about some of the most fundamental issues of our society. Your courses, your curric curriculum, your programs, the methodology and the pedagogy adopted towards learning should seek a transformation of an individual. It helps people come to terms with the past, develop an understanding of the present and prepare them to charter ideas and perspectives for the future. The need for acquiring knowledge in a range of subjects, including philosophy, history, literature, sociology, anthropology, psychology, while pursuing interests in music, theater, performing arts, and fine arts is the hallmark of a sound liberal education. The third aspect of liberal arts education is understanding heritage. One of the important goals of education is to work towards achieving what I would call enlightened citizenship. Education needs to promote a greater degree of civilizational understanding. India has a rich and long tradition of promoting civilizational understanding through education. The inspiring institutions of higher education in India, Takshashila University and 
all we can call it institutions because they were not universities as we understand today. So both Takshishila and Nalanda, but also Vikramshila and Vallabhi and others promoted liberal arts and humanities education long before any institutions of the world. I had the privilege to study at Oxford, which was nearly 800 years old. Bologna is probably a little over 900 years old, but long before Oxford and Bologna, we had in this part of the world, such institutions which were truly liberal arts institutions. Takshishila University, established over 2,700 years ago, had over 10,000 students from around the world and studied subjects as diversified as the Vedas, philosophy, grammar, politics, astronomy, future, music, Ayurveda, agriculture, surgery, and commerce. Takshishila University probably is the oldest liberal arts college of the world. India needs to revive this rich and inspiring cultural and educational history of promoting what we call transnational humanities education. Citizenship is about taking people taking responsibility. And enlightened citizenship cannot be achieved unless people receive a sound and rigorous education in liberal arts and humanities. The fourth aspect of what JSLH does is the skills for advancement. Liberal arts education provides opportunities for students to develop a range of skills that are essential to become lifelong learners. In fact, the skills relating to reflective reading, critical thinking, effective writing, and verbal communications are central for any professional advancement and development. Liberal arts education gives due emphasis to inculcate these skills in students as these are relevant not only for the next job, that the graduate of a college will aspire, but for a long time to come. In fact, possibly the jobs that don't exist today, the jobs that are going to come in the future. The future of education will depend upon how effectively we are able to impart knowledge, skills, and perspectives that will make promote versatility and will be able to empower them in a variety of professional endeavors. So, the benefits of studying liberal arts is wide ranging and liberal arts and humanities education foregrounds and fosters critical thinking capacities in students a behavioral aspect that is more and more in demand today, not just in the world of politics and governance, but also in the world of business and industry. We no longer live in a day where technical skills and specialization per se are sufficient for growth in the working world. In today's, I dare say, competitive world, an individual may have technical skills of a certain kind, but if he or she doesn't have the requisite analytical acumen to communicate and articulate views or weigh the pros and cons of complex issues, they are not going to be useful in the working world beyond the point. This is where a full rounded education in the liberal arts makes an individual a complete personality with the ability to bring in a broad range of knowledge and insights to any task at hand. The need for advancing multidisciplinary education is profoundly felt in India given our strong commitment to democracy and pluralism. Let me move to another important aspect. Deepening of democracy requires investing in education that advances the values of democracy alongside the self-criticism of these values. At a time when both established democracies, which are old and new and emerging democracies are under threat, internal democratic institutions are also possibly under threat, we need to steadfastly hold these values. And who are going to do that? Who are those people who are going to do it? It is you, the students of Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, as you become responsible citizens, enlightened citizens, global citizens, you will be torchbearers of that value of freedom, democracy, and pluralism. The critical study of these values will inevitably mean a stronger focus on humanities education. It is not possible to deepen democracy without students like you being given an opportunity to understand that these values are critical and a thorough and a serious study of humanities is indeed almost inevitable for the growth and development of an individual. 
It is also important to change attitudes of all stakeholders in education, including primary and secondary education on the one hand, leading to higher education on the other. And that is where we come in. Let me also share with you a bit of my own personal perspectives on this. At a time when the career choices and the study choices that students make are to a large extent defined by parental choices and pressure from society, the obsession to make choices of study and careers purely based on employability and immediate financial gains and nothing else has neither led to employability, employability nor enlightenment. So, how do we strike a balance there? Well, promoting employability is obviously a critical goal, and I will not uh, in any way undermine that aspect. Liberal arts education creates opportunities for students to develop knowledge and critical thinking abilities. That is the hallmark of good education. Unfortunately, India does have a challenge of not having a number of liberal arts colleges, at least the kind of multidisciplinary liberal arts colleges that we are talking about. Even the colleges that do have a few degree options in liberal arts and humanities do not fully understand and appreciate the pedagogical foundations of liberal education. There has been far too much emphasis on specialized education with a view to focusing on specific areas of interest and not to challenge the boundaries of knowledge and thought processes. Employers are not only looking for people with knowledge, but would expect graduates to be problem solvers who can read and reflect effectively, who can write and communicate persuasively, and who can be sensitive and appreciate the complexities of the society and the humanity that we live today. A liberal and humanities education equips students with the analytical in inventiveness and versatility of mind, which makes careers possible, whether in business, consulting, academia, government, NGOs, journalism, creative industries, and numerous other professions. In many ways, I would like to congratulate this incoming class of 2020 of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities for the choices that you made. I also want to take this opportunity to thank your parents for helping you make those choices. I do believe that a lot of young Indians are constantly struggling to make those choices. At a time when most young people grow up in our country, aspiring to become an engineer, not because it is their own personal choice, but most of the time defined by the societal and family-based uh, you know, imaginations, you have challenged that thinking. And congratulations to you. For all the parents, thank you for supporting and fulfilling the dreams and aspirations of your children. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the faculty members of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, as well as the, our really inspiring dean, Professor Kathleen Madroski, and all others who have been part of this effort to build a world-class liberal arts and humanities school at OP Jindal Global University. I look forward to welcoming you to our campus. We will not leave any stone unturned to ensure that each one of you receive an absolutely world-class education to the extent we can do it now in online and hopefully to bring you back into campus as and when it is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Rajkumar. Um, now, it's my uh, great privilege uh, and honor to welcome our uh, guest speaker uh, today, uh, Gita Hariharan. Um, many of us uh, know uh, Gita Hariharan as a, a, a novelist. Her uh, first novel, The Thousand Faces of Night, uh, won the 1992 Commonwealth Writers' Prize. And since then, she has published uh, many books, including uh, short story collections, uh, uh, a, a significant one called The Art of Dying, uh, The Ghosts of Vasu Master, uh, When Dreams Travel, in times of siege, fugitive stories, uh, and more recently, um, uh, last year, uh, a book that could uh, appeal to you because it's about students uh, called I Have Become the Tide. Um, uh, her more recent edited collection is called Battling for India, a Citizen's Reader. My personal favorite, you know, as a geographer working on ideas of home, belonging, and identity, 
is uh, Gita Hariharan's uh, book called Almost Home. Uh, you know, and it's about uh, different cities that she has been in and how places become imbued, uh, you know, with these stories, with narratives of the many different people uh, that inhabit it. And this is really one of the defining features of uh, Gita Hariharan's work uh, to, through storytelling uh, to, to bring out multiple narratives a theme uh, that she's going to talk to us about uh, more today. Uh, beyond uh, her writing, uh, uh, Gita Hariharan has also been uh, you know, a vocal uh, spokesperson about uh, women's right. In um, 1995, uh, she challenged the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act and uh, won the case, uh, which led to you know, the recognizing of mothers as, as, um, as a legal guardian uh, as well. Uh, more recently, um, uh, Gita Hariharan has been engaged, uh, she's a founder member of the Indian Writers Forum, which is a public trust set up to promote Indian diversity and freedom of expression. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing more uh, from her about the importance of um, you know, putting out and uh, championing uh, multiple narratives. So a very warm welcome to you, um, uh, Ms. Gita Hariharan, and I'll, um, I'll let you speak now. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be back in a university, even if it is in the strange online manner. But I must say that rather than saying it's strange and it's a crisis, uh, we should uh, view this new uh, adventure as precisely that. Uh, for uh, writers like me who spend years uh, locked up in a room uh, writing a book, uh, the chance to be able to speak to people in spite of an assortment of viruses, both man-made and otherwise, um, we appreciate that. But let me, let me start at the beginning. I'm going to um, address the uh, young students in particular. So uh, the, the gray heads among us must excuse me uh, if I privilege uh, the young people here today because they're the reason we're here not just to teach, but also to learn from you. Because what keeps us oldies alive is our connection uh, with you young people. Um, I want to start off by saying that, you know, there's a lot of talk of milestones in your life. In India, we tend to think of uh, that board exam as a milestone. Um, which is a bit of a fraud, I must tell you. The real milestone is when all these years of preparation, whether it was giving up sports to sit and study for the exams, whether it was those wretched tuitions, whether it was, uh, you know, all the little compromises you've made in the last few years, all the hard work, all the joy you've had from discovering new things. This is a moment when you are getting on that ship. It really is the moment when you are getting on the ship because now you are officially on the way to adulthood. Now, that doesn't, adulthood like education doesn't end so easily. We continue, um, we continue to learn some very hard lessons uh, though we were adults, we turned adult a long time ago. There is a very interesting relationship between uh, learning and teaching that, uh, you know, now in my 60s, I sometimes think, my God, why, didn't, why did it take me so long to learn this? But also there's a certain element of joy there. My goodness, I can still learn. There is still uh, so much for me to learn you know, so much for me to read, so many people to discover and so on. So 
this is a time when your bodies have been prepared for a certain kind of work, whether it is reading, whether it's understanding, whether it is expressing yourself through dance, whether through your voice to sing and so on. So there's a physical preparation that's brought you to this point. There's a mental preparation that's brought you to this point. And then you have your luggage. Now, the ship that you get on, there are other people there. It will take you to different worlds. How are you going to greet these new worlds, some of which will not be easy to understand, in some of which they will speak languages that you don't quite know, in some places where you stop for a day or two, they will eat food you have never seen before. They will have a history of suffering, dreams that you know nothing about. Will you be afraid because they're different from you? Will you scorn them because they're different from you? Will you try and find links between the history they carry, who they are today, and who you are. Um, I must refer here to a rather wonderful Moroccan sociologist called Fatima Mernisi. Her grandmother, Yasmin, Yasmina, never left the harem. She lived behind that wall all her life. But she had something that all of us have as equipment, regardless of which wall you are behind, which was the imagination, which feeds your reason, which feeds your understanding. So Yasmina called her granddaughter Fatima and said, you know, it is your responsibility to travel and discover all the mysteries of Allah's beautiful planet. Here was this old woman who had never gone beyond this wall, who was able to give her granddaughter a primer in not just what a writer should be, a traveler should be, but what education really is, which is to learn about yourself by learning about other people. So I want to start off by saying that there is a relationship between learning and teaching. Both are lifelong exercises. And that may not mean a great deal to those of you young people who are starting off now, but remember it at some point. Because why are these things so important to remember? Because what makes a really good teacher? Who are the teachers I remember from the time I was your age? They were the teachers who you could exchange books with. You know, I clearly remember at the age of 17 in uh, what was then Bombay, uh, saying to a wonderful teacher of mine called Nita Pillay, I said, you know, I have read a Japanese writer called Yasunari Kawabata and I, I can't get over it because, you know, we were, our syllabus just gave us more and more of, um, of, of British literature. So to discover Japanese literature and translation was a huge thing. And she said, oh, lend me the book. So in education, in uh, charting these new frontiers, we are all colleagues. Of course, some of us are older and might know a little more, but in terms of discovering new things and sharing knowledge, we are all colleagues. And I think this is very, very important to remember, not just between teachers and students, but between the variety of students you're going to encounter. One of the great joys of going to college, especially in a country like India, is that you leave the relative protection, the relative 
homogeneity, the, the single, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, family name, uh, nature of schools, which are defined by what class you come from, which region you're in and so on. And suddenly you're in a place where you are meeting people from very, very different parts of India. This is your first lesson, not only in education, but also in what the humanities might mean. What that word liberal might mean. It means you are liberal about breaking down walls. You are liberal about allowing the other you have only heard of and mostly in the form of prejudice. So-and-so sorts of people are dirty, so-and-so sort of people are, you know, the kind of prejudice and propaganda that fills our lives, even though we may not be aware of it. So this is your chance to break that wall and say that the color of the skin doesn't matter, the caste that somebody's from doesn't matter, it does, but I'll, we'll talk about how it does, but not in terms of your ability to find out about these people's lives. We can never live more than our lives, but everything we do, our conversations, our reading, our writing, our time at the university allows us to initiate these conversations which is going to be a source of tremendous excitement in our lives because it's going to give us the chance to doubt stereotypes that were put in our head, to doubt even received wisdom. If people tell you this is how they are, they is always the sort of, you know, enemy. Doubt is the first, is the starting point of all human knowledge, of all human discovery. Could it really be? That's how we know even that the earth is not flat. So if people before us had not been doubtful, we would not have half the ideas. You know, if large numbers of people in the world were told, have been told throughout history that you are inferior because of the color of your skin. You are inferior because we've colonized you. You're inferior because you're a woman or because you are Dalit or you're Adivasi. And if that doubt did not plant a very potent seed in your head, say, is it true? Is it true? Are we men, women really incapable of being thinking creatures? Are black people, do they have smaller brains? You know, at one point, pseudoscientists came out with this kind of pseudoscience. So knowledge can also be a malignant enterprise, which is why you begin with doubt. Then you ask questions. Now, the business of questioning, and I think this is very important to say in our times where everybody has the internet and the uh, social media and the blog and all these areas to ask questions. When you ask questions, you better know what the other side is talking about. You know, when I teach a writing class, I always say experiment is very good. But before you experiment, you would better know how you actually, you know, write mainstream, conventional, uh, 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 what is expected of you. Then you say, well, this is, suppose I turn this upside down, does it matter? So in other words, questioning does not mean locking up your library, locking up your teachers, it means listening to them, learning as much as you can about society as it is, 
with all its warts, with all its old fault lines, with all its new divisive lines. And then you turn around and ask the questions. So there is that kind of, what I'm doing really is unpacking this word education, which is even more fundamental an exercise than talking about liberal arts. You know, uh, we live in a society where which of us hasn't heard in India say, oh, don't listen to so-and-so, he's uneducated. What does she know? She's uneducated. So there is this entire uh, kind of strange conflation or putting together of supposedly educated, which is linked with merely a degree, and being cultured, which is linked in a very superficial way with being able to sing five and a half songs and be able to identify six and a half poets. In real life, education is much more complex and much more exciting. So is culture. So in our, what, what am I saying? Let me, let me do a quick kind of list of my ambition for you. One is, as you go into those classrooms, whether in real time or virtual, when you read, when you argue with each other, when you discuss with each other, when you make your presentations, what do you want to do? Suppose you have a poem. Now, this is a very hard lesson to learn because a lot of us who did our BA and our liberal arts and so forth, and it took us forever to understand that some poem written in the 16th century by some white man sitting in England, which we had never set eyes on, had something called a context. You see? So why was this poem being written then? Why was this play being written then? Why was this economic theory being floated then? Why were they talking about the white man's burden then? So there is a context. And what does this mean? It means that all of us are children of our own times. You know, 20 years from now, hopefully when COVID is only a distant memory and they found vaccines for even more viruses and they look at our you know, like a time capsule, they look at what's happening this morning. They will point out, why is this woman saying all this? Why is the dean saying all this? Why is the VC saying all this? Because there is a context. This is what the world was going through. This was the state of people trying to come together. And this was a state of what was keeping both people as well as nations apart. You see? So that's context. Find out who said this? Where was he or she coming from? What was the time? What were the times? So doubt, debate, argument, breaking down of walls. Then, as I said, imagination. Now, this is really important because it sounds like a truism to say the imagination is important, speculation is important in a university space. But why am I emphasizing this? Because we do live in times where this very, very important tool of knowledge, speculation, imagination, which allows you to say, suppose this is what it was. Where did, where did caste come from? Let's have a discussion about it. Could it have been? And then you go back. Because we don't have any sort of, you know, clear evidence. So whether it's the past or the future, we have to speculate. We have to make what we call educated guesses. This is the information. This is the context. So it's a very exciting game, knowledge. Now, if somebody comes and says, no, don't imagine. We know exactly what happened 
a thousand years back. And there's only one version of it. There is only one story. We're in trouble. Forget COVID-19. We don't need a university. So if education is a lifelong process, the university years are the peak, are the peak. Your brains are ripe, your bodies are ripe. You're not only going to learn, you're going to create an atmosphere of learning, a buzz of conversations in the plural, that is going to help you ask the right questions, always more important than the right answers, and you're going to help us revitalize our old questions and say, oh, maybe this is another way to look at it. And here I must say in parentheses, I'm not saying this just to be nice. Very often when I'm reading from my uh, work and I get a question saying, oh, uh, I notice all your titles are in plural. Is that deliberate? And uh, I say, no, it isn't. But you've actually taught me something about my writing process, which I wasn't aware of. And of course, jokingly, I'll say, can I steal that and use that in my next talk? So uh, learning is also this continuous kind of relay race where there is a balance between standing on other people's shoulders the wonderful poet A.K. Ramanujan said, what do I have that I have not received? So that is one aspect of what we have. But there is also the other aspect, which is a lifelong attempt to formulate your own take, your own original understanding of what you've heard. I must ask somebody to, to uh, look at me very sternly when I'm running out of time, um, because I really have no idea what the time is. I also want to say some things about this business of liberal arts. This breaking down of walls is good. These artificial divisions that we have too much of, especially in India, that's good. What do I mean by those artificial divisions? I suspect this continues. But when we were children, it was almost like the caste system. They would, you would be separated into, are you a science type? Which meant you were smart. Uh, are you an arts type? Which meant, you know, you were soft. And uh, well, yeah, you also need, it's like saying, we also need women in the world. Mm -hmm. even if they can't do science. That was the implication. So that you would have the sort of, well, you know, this, this uh, binary between arts and science is old hat. We left that behind in the 19th century. Some of our parents didn't get news of it, that's all. But the point is that many of us today find that now we want to learn about mathematics. Now we want to learn about science. Some of us find that we might have done literature, but we're quite adept at using technology. So on the one hand, you want to break down these very artificial divisions and also the social value ascribed to certain professions. On the other hand, this is really important to remember that this does not mean that we create a kind of kitchery where anything goes. Rigor is just as important. I always tell um, literature students that don't think because it's poetry, anything is possible. There is a logic there. There are principles by which that whole system functions. So, I uh, want to say that this is a balance we want to achieve. Finally, I think, let me come to the most important part of what I want to say, which is 
the meaning of an education, the meaning of this lifelong conversation has to be that it is not just about ourselves, but about the world around us. If your education, if your discussion, if your book learning, if your conversations do not allow you to see the world with all its joys and sorrows and painful divisions, with all its apartheid of caste, with its terrible divisions of community, with its victimizing people in different times, in different ways, then the whole exercise is lost. Because really, this is the armor we have to say in different parts of the world that we will recognize difference. We will not pretend that everybody lives in the same way. We will recognize difference. We will bring reason, imagination, and our very, very, very strong commitment to the idea of equality in all ways to our lives as learners. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Geta Hariharan. That was a thought-provoking uh, speech. Uh, we'll see, we have about uh, 15 minutes uh, for discussion. Uh, so students, uh, faculty members, whoever's watching, uh, please, if you could uh, just type, up, type out your questions uh, in the chat box, I will be able to relate to um, uh, Geeta Hariharan. Any questions? Okay. Um. Well, while people are, are, are thinking, uh, maybe I could, I could uh, ask Okay, uh, sorry, there is already a question. Um, uh, Shrirup uh, Chaudhary, who's asking um, that, uh, who's saying that uh, he fully agrees with you. And if you could just say a few words about how uh, us liberal arts people should stand up in the face of so much intolerance around the world. Uh, Gita, would you like to take that question? How yes. can uh, a liberal arts student stand up uh, to so much intolerance in the world today? Um, you know, I, I want to point out that um, uh, heroism <laughs> is, is, is actually a, a real and small thing. Now, uh, uh, we live in such troubled times uh, where you can be, uh, uh, without uh, exaggeration, I can say that you can be trolled, you can be hounded, you can be picked up, in fact, um, for what you say. We live in times like that. But what can you do? I think uh, what we have this word dissent that we have been using a lot. Uh, which is uh, a disagreement, argument, and so on. One way, a real way for all of us to dissent is by doing what we do really well. If you're a student, your business is to listen to as many people as you can, to learn as much as you can, and ask questions. If you're a teacher, your business is to present as many points of view 
and not say, well, the powers of be uh, the powers that be would will not like this particular thing discussed, so we won't have the seminar or we won't invite this particular person and so on and so forth. This is one way, one modest way, one realistic way to say, look, we are in the business of learning because that is the only way we can allow this very, very diverse country, this diverse world to survive. So this is what I would say. It, it would be to continue reading, to continue asking questions, you know, but in a completely rational way. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gita. Um, there's another question about... Um, about something you said about uh, in between about history. Um, Sagar, this is a question from Sagar Tiwari. Uh, Sagar, would you like to explain it a bit more? It's a, it's a question about um, something about in between uh, in history that you mentioned, uh, Gita, in your talk. Uh, if you could talk a bit more about that. And then there's another question, which I'll take if you would like to um, answer together. Uh, this is from a student. Uh, I'm a law student still having an inclination towards liberal arts and could beautifully see the intertwining of these two knots equally. Why isn't that this circuitous effect is appreciated? Um, okay, so there are uh, two questions, I think parts uh, question is about um, the connections uh, between liberal arts and other fields of study and um, why don't we see this intertwining more uh, and Sagar question is more about your point that the past matters uh, so if you could say a bit more about that Uh, over to you, Gita. Yeah, yes, sorry. Uh, they're two, two very good questions and they're quite different. So I hope I don't get a little uh, mixed up. The, uh, uh, the, the connection between uh, law and other aspects uh, of your life, you know, what the liberal arts person's interest would be. There's a great deal, by the way. In, in real life, whether these are studied, these links are studied in the classroom or not, um, off the top of my head, I think of, for example, the question of ownership of knowledge. Uh, there's been a lot of work done, say, to find out um, if, if you have, uh, say, the uh, 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 Hindi cinema, uh, using uh, a, a piece of music from traditional musicians, uh, say the Mir musicians in Rajasthan. Now, um, this is very much like, if you like, like the Lion King story. Hakuna Matata was apparently written by uh, a man, um, you know, uh, who was paid finally five pounds for this huge grosser. Okay, that is a commercial aspect. Here, we are also talking about traditional, quote unquote, traditional knowledge, and who owns it. Now, this is a very complex question, because it's not as if traditional is sitting there by itself, as a lot of our um, uh, Hindu supremacists would like to say. Tradition and history are not, or culture, are not sort of independent creatures sitting there, and refusing to be contaminated by the uh, touch of uh, our modern day hands. That's simply not true. All these belong to us. And throughout history, we have said, this is what we reject. This is what we're going to fight against. This is what we're going to remake. So as far as the connection between certain legal questions um, and the liberal arts, uh, there are very, very important questions of ownership, which have uh, both legal as well as philosophical implications. 
because the whole idea of ownership of a piece of art or uh, a, a, a piece of music is a relatively new thing, historically speaking. So then you have fascinating liberal arts questions in that situation that I uh, gave as an example of the musicians, which is once you have a hit in um, uh, Bollywood based on that, and um, does that mean that is corrupted uh, tradition? Then if naturally they decide to perform only that, does that mean their tradition has changed? Now, if you go there as a researcher and you ask certain questions, are they really telling you what is, in short, is tradition being changed on a day-to-day -day basis? And what is your investment in tradition? Do you want it to be a museum? You know, as a researcher, you want to know how it was, but do you want it to stay still? Can culture sit still? Can language sit still? Or will it insist on crossing not only regional borders, but also the borders of time and ownership? So that is a, a rather complicated answer to what I think is a very interesting and complicated question. The other thing about the importance of the past, well, um, the world is now in a place where we are asking ourselves that in fundamental ways, a whole range of ways. I'm sure all of you know that in the United States today, they're asking, should we have invested in a different kind of public health system? Would we have been better prepared then to handle the pandemic. In countries like India, we're asking, well, that is, that is the vision we began our lives as an independent nation with. What happened? When did we create even more divisions, even more fault lines of inequity, inequity so that in a situation like COVID, you have huge swathes of our population who are called migrants, as if they will never have a home, as if they never had a home, you see? So the past is really important, not because we can relive it, not because boasting about it is going to help in any way. This is something I have to mention because in India, we love to boast about our past real or imaginary. So finally, let me be really crude. In the real world, in the present, the past is only useful in so far as we can see its lessons and we can benefit from them. In so far as we can see the significance of even failed action, all those struggles people made throughout history, even if they failed in the short term, what can we learn from them, not only about what we do, but about other people's aspirations and dreams? I think the past can be as much of a minefield as the present, because the past can be fabricated for political ends. So the past is very important. And I think living in India, um, yeah, uh, we have far too many examples. I'm sure that you, all of you will come up with examples of how important the past is, how it stalks us, nips at uh, uh, us at our heels, but how we can actually say the past is there, but the past, if you like, is like this technology. The computer doesn't rule you. The internet doesn't rule you. You use it for your present needs. And that's how I think we should look at the past. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are two more questions, and I think we can take just these two. Uh, the first one is from Anusha Sharma. 
who says, uh, thank you for a very inspirational talk. How do you think studying liberal arts differs from studying, for example, English literature, where one might study similar concepts, but through literature? And the second question is again uh, from Parth Goswami, who, uh, who asked, hasn't the cultural modernity accepted by people today covered the vibrant effects of the past cultural systems, traditions, and practices? Um, so it's a question about cultural modernity and whether or not it covers the diverse uh, cultural systems of the past. Uh, so again, two very different questions, and I'm afraid we have time just for uh, these two. Um, so over to you, Gita. Okay. The um, I'm sorry, the first one, uh, would you repeat the first question? Because I, I got distracted by the second. Yes. The first question is about uh, studying how li ah. liberal arts, how studying liberal arts is different Yes. from uh, studying, let's say, doing a degree in English literature uh, through, uh, you know, where one might study different concepts, but through literature. That's, that's a, a, a question that I used to ask myself when I was young. Um, I had a rather odd um, uh, undergraduate uh, experience, which is that the first two years uh, I happened to be in Manila. So I did um, liberal arts for the first two years of college, and then I shifted to Bombay. So I did a, a BA in um, uh, Inglit, we used to call it, and it was really just that, um, uh, British literature uh, for two years. And my advice is, especially if you want to be a writer, don't bother with doing a BA in literature because uh, uh, these are very artificial uh, divisions. Uh, we were taught, uh, as I, I, I said earlier uh, this morning, that uh, we were taught poems and plays and, you know, without, without connection, without connection, you know, as if these bits of literature were floating uh, in a vacuum. And what liberal arts does is that it tells you, well, you know, Shakespeare was writing uh, these, these uh, plays in this particular context. This is what England was going through. So you suddenly read The Tempest, and I certainly hope all of you will discover this rather marvelous play, and uh, find that there is a, a, a creature who does not speak the language of the people who've come to this island as conquerors, and he's considered a beast, a barbarian. That's what the word barbarian means, that you speak barbar -bar and nobody knows what you're saying. So uh, all this, you see, okay, what was England going through in those times? So this is not, this is a very interesting learning exercise to say that, yes, they were writing things, they were entertaining themselves with things, they were imagining things which had some relationship with the world they were in, with the ambitions they had. And a lot of it had to do with perpetuating ideas of inequality. So, uh, that is the only way we can understand colonialism, you see? So when they start exploring the world, you know, what happens? So that is, um, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the large implications of the small choices we make as students, what you choose to learn. So I would say opt for the bigger stage, get as much as you can at this stage. So that is one thing. Then the very hard and uh, cerebral question that we're going to end the morning with about modernity. And I'm so glad that we are ending on a not, note of modernity, not the postmodern. I'm allergic to anything which is post something, especially sitting where we are, where we've been trying to get to the modern forever. Um, 
modern is a very good word. Modern doesn't mean you throw out what everybody likes to call tradition. What it means is that you test, you test what you receive, whether it is tradition, whether it is received wisdom, you test it with the good tools you've been given, reason, imagination, and the education that you hopefully will pick up in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, we had one last question, but we don't uh, have time to take this, but I think students can think about it. It's a, it's a, it's a question from Stephen Marx about uh, how the VC mentioned employability of liberal arts uh, graduates. And uh, that's something uh, that we need to think about. Um, you know, it's a complex question of uh, career paths. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, we can't take the last question because we've uh, run out of time. Uh, but please, um, you know, join me in thanking Ms. Gita Hariharan for this wonderful uh, talk. And uh, I would, uh, I mean, I think the question answer session would have gone on uh, for long, um, uh, but maybe we can continue the engagement over chat uh, later. Uh, but I would like to invite uh, the registrar, uh, Professor Sridhar Patnaik, uh, to give the concluding remarks now. Uh, Professor Patnaik, are you there? Uh, Am I audible? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Journey and uh, Kathleen and friends. Uh, it's such a uh, delight, uh, you know, being a part of the uh, commencement lecture uh, this morning, organized by the Jindal School of Liberal Arts, and uh, even listening to uh, Gita Hariharan. Uh, normally, this time of the year, the campus is uh, abyss with academic and co-curricular activities, uh, with all the students uh, getting to know the faculty and fellow classmates, and thus trying to make a new connect. Uh, however, we all understand this year we are into special circumstances, uh, but uh, the positive side is that having these lectures online or in a virtual mode, we are also joined by their uh, parents and uh, friends and relatives uh, who normally uh, do not get an opportunity to take part in our university activities. And it is such a pleasure uh, listening to uh, Geeta Hariharan this morning in terms of uh, what it means to be uh, studying at a university and to be receiving education uh, at a university. Uh, we could not have asked for more in terms of the topic uh, chosen to speak because it aptly captures uh, the philosophy or uh, the idea of uh, Jindal School of uh, Liberal Arts and Humanities, uh, which is created <laughs> by uh, Professor Kathleen Matroski, the Dean, and her team of uh, accomplished faculty members. And we are also immensely thankful uh, to uh, Geeta uh, for her uh, insightful and inspirational lecture uh, that talked about, it's like a masterclass on uh, research and uh, even the way to think and how to think and the strands of knowledge and the forms of knowledge and how one can try to be original, uh, both in terms of uh, developing their cognition and even fine tuning their intuitive knowledge. So we are grateful to Geeta for all the inputs uh, that she had provided. And uh, I also take this opportunity to congratulate all the students of uh, the BA Liberal Arts Program and also the uh, uh, fellowship program uh, started by uh, the JSLH this year. Uh, each one of you are exceptional and uh, you all truly uh, deserve this recognition to be a part of uh, the School of uh, Liberal Arts and Humanities. And let me just make a very important mention. At the JGU, we have an enriching academic and social ecosystem that will help you all develop your essential capacities uh, intellectually, socially, and emotionally. And these qualities are important to do well in your lives and career. Let me also tell you, 
Being a university student is a great responsibility. A responsibility towards your own learning, a respect for university regulations, spaces, and diversity. But I must make a mention that it is indeed enchanting to be at uh, the Jindal Global University as uh, JGU is a place of ideas, bonhomie, and eloquence. And we do take the approach of student-centered learning to make each one of you eloquent in whatever you intend to do. Therefore, I suggest all our dear students to focus on ideating, long-term planning, and benefit from the learning opportunities we provide within the classroom and in the realm of university life and exercise your freedom and responsibility with a sense of discretion and capture the multiple narratives of a university education as rightly outlined by uh, Ms. Geeta Hariharan. In closing, I wish to thank the commencement speaker once again and colleagues from various offices at the university uh, who had worked hard in ensuring a successful inauguration of the academic year and by putting together this wonderful program. It's indeed a collective effort and it is difficult to take all the names, uh, but I would like to sincerely thank uh, the leadership of the Dean of uh, the School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, the Office of Admissions and Outreach, the School Office, the Information Technology Services and the Communications Office and the Office of the Registrar and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for all the efforts, indulgence and leadership and coordination. And I would also like to specially thank all the students and parents for their active participation in the lecture and everyone who attended the lecture. Our best wishes to each one of you on a successful start of the academic year and before I close, I must mention that being at JGU is a transformation bridge. Something similar to what you all experienced in terms of the questions raised by Catherine Metrovsky. So please make the most of it and make your stay here a very engaging and an enriching one. Thank you all once again, the program has ended. Uh Thank you uh, very much, uh, Prasanna Patnaik, for uh, joining us. And thank you, everyone, uh, really, to join in this morning. A very big thank you to Geeta Hariharan uh, for joining us. A special thank you to Gargi Bharadwaj for connecting her uh, with us. Um, and uh, to Sri Rup Chaudhary to put this all together. And of course, our brilliant uh, IT team. Uh, thanks also to Sagar Tiwari and to Simranjit Kaur and Ritu Singh at the JSLH uh, Executive Office. Um, so this morning has really left us with uh, many thoughts. Uh, let's continue the discussion in our classrooms uh, elsewhere. Um, and yes, let's keep going. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.